Welcome to another video about my Ford Model T. I bought this uh, some years ago now as a COVID project and somehow it ended up taking years even though it's a fairly simple car. Anyhow in this video I've decided to uh, show how I've built the boat tail, the new boat tail for the rear so it looks a little bit more cool. And how I decided to do this was I decided to use stainless steel angle iron. I seem to make everything out of stainless steel nowadays. You know, I go to install a shower in a house and some reason I end up with my welder and the stainless steel out again. But anyhow, so I decided to use this angle. The problem with angle though is when you go to bend it, it kinks in two ways. So I came up with these adaptations for my um, tube bender that would basically try and hold the angle straight as it was bent. And it did seem to work quite well. So there's the uh, top rail for the Model T. So I've used this um, 30 by 30 by three millimeter stainless steel angle. And most of it I've bent with my tube bender, which is also my seat when it's not in use. Um, but around here, the radius was so tight that you, I just couldn't do it. So I had to cut, bend, cut, bend to get this uh, nice curve here. And the cool thing is once you've welded this, I mean, it's really best if you do it while you're welding. You can hammer on there and you can make it the curve even calmer and nicer. So here's my framework, all in stainless and it's, uh, it's starting to get there. I've just welded the bottom frame up here, um, but I need to have a cutout around here, all the way up to here and down again so that the spring can articulate up and down. So I've just welded in the cross beam and along this end I've welded this uh, the rear up and now it's ready to cut out so I've ground through most of the line um, so I don't want to be doing too much cutting inside the garage it makes a hell of a mess I've got a nice fiberglass welding blanket to stick on all this lot so I don't damage paint too much and then I'm just going to cut through that and then that comes off and then I get on. Now this polishing of stainless has been a real pain. So here, um, I'm trying to get everything to a mirror finish. And you can see there's lots of marks. Well, those marks are where I've just chamfered the edge here. But you can see there's marks here, line marks from the angle grinder, the 120 disc still. So I'm just trying to figure out how to get everything out. This is the disc um, the coarse disc that I'm using in the angle grinder, the polishing disc, and that does get these marks out, but it takes so long to polish stainless, it's a nightmare. You know, on the boat bits, I didn't have to worry too much because, you know, if there's slight scratches in them, and I only had a couple of slight scratches left in them, but it doesn't really matter. They're 10, 12 meters up the mast, no one's going to see, apart from the seagulls and me, but I won't be paying much attention because. When I got the mast, all I'm worried about is falling off. And, um, you know, so I don't pay much attention to those sort of things. But, you know, trying to polish this up to a good state is really, really difficult. Anyhow, it's briefly all sort of in one piece. And now I have to cut it apart and have it all in bits again, which is a bit of a shame, but I have to get on. But hopefully next weekend, I might just have completed all this and got the, this, this floor welded back in, slightly dropped and back with that cut out around the, the springs done. And then I won't be far from putting wood in it and um, making it all nice. Looking forward to that. With cutting this, you'll notice that I'm not wearing gloves, which is very, very stupid. I should be wearing gloves. I always wear gloves, particularly with these fine cutting discs. Uh, if they slip and you're aiming towards your hand, they create a very, very nice thin cut. I almost went through the tendon of my thumb once, just sort of nicked the edge of the tendon and got away with it, but it would have been microsurgery and all kinds of stuff to try and fix it. I, I don't use guards on these grinders because they're five inch and they get in the way. The guards are really just annoying. Uh, obviously, with a big nine inch grinder, you... I always keep my guard on that one because that's that's fairly hideous. But these ones, the guards just get so much in the way that you can actually end up hurting yourself because you ended up putting the grinder in such a sort of convoluted position that then it can actually snatch back. 
The reason why I ended up having to do this with cutting the piece off like this in place is because when you're welding stainless, it can, or any metal, you know, it moves, things move, you know, the, the distortion and the shrinking of the weld pulls stuff around, sometimes by millimeters, sometimes it looks nice and sometimes it really pulls it around. It's, it's a little bit hard to judge, even with years of experience. So the easiest thing to do is weld it on the car in one piece and then you know when you cut it, it shouldn't really move afterwards. It does get rather annoying trying to cut these bits off there. So these are the sides for the boat tower. So this is the angle iron that I've bent all to shape using my tube bender. And here I'm just welding these little tabs on here. So this is the underneath of the car because I'm going to put two pieces of wood, one glued to the other one. And I'm going to sh chamfer them to a nice sort of curve so you haven't got a straight sort of edge on the bottom of the car which would look really ugly. So all I'm doing with these is sticking them on like that, holding them with the pliers there and then because I've gone and put a bevel on them and the TIG, you haven't got three hands so you're holding this with one hand, you've got the TIG torch in the other what I'm doing is I'm just resting a bit of welding rod there and using that to make the initial tack and then you just break the welding rod off and use it on the next one and now it's held on there you can adjust it and then you've got two hands now one for feeding the rod like so and the other one with your tick torch yeah it's a bit, of a bit fiddly sometimes to take that you know with mig you've got a hand free so you can hold things and pull things around anyhow the polishing is working slowly i've been going from uh, i get to the final one with the um, angle grinder mop pads and then what I do is I uh, use wet and dry. I've used 240 in places, but then I've gone to 320 to 400 to 600. And then it should be good with a polishing mop and the compound then. Because I, I found that if you go straight from the sort of scotch bright pad that comes with the set to the polishing, you've still got lines in it. So I thought if I go an intermediate stage by hand, it's slightly less aggressive and gets rid of the scratches. Um, before then going to polish them up. I'm going to state this drill bit. That side's gone. That flute's gone. Look, this flute's gone too. And yet, it's still drilling through stainless steel. I've just been through six millimeters of stainless steel with that, and it was cutting quite well. How's that work? To make sure everything's straight, I've been using a laser level. These things are really great because as soon as you've leveled up the car, you can put the laser level, line it up to the, the center line of the car. And then, you know, you know, you've got everything absolutely straight to within the width of the laser line, which is, you know, half a millimeter. And obviously half a millimeter accuracy on a car that's only what, 12, 13, 14 foot long, something like that is really good. Right. So we're trying to weld all this up and weld these corners in, everything shifted. So now I've ended up with my pipe bender here because the spare wheel carrier was putting the spare wheel too far back and it was gonna run into the plywood sides that are going in here. You know, by pushing the wheel too far back, it was too wide at this point. So I've lifted my pipe bender up on here and I've managed to rig it up like this. I have my laser level painting a mark along there somewhere and I start off with 3.5 and now I've just got to crank this like this it's really bending it um, I think I needed at least another centimeter back again it literally pulled that back about a centimeter so if I get my tape measure here I can see that I'm now, I was on 3.5. Don't be difficult. Where is it? I'm now on 4.5. You can just about see it's 4.5. And after over bend, I think I need to go to about five centimeters. But I'm conscious I don't want to mess this up, so let's look down here. And it's, it's looking okay, it's giving it that bend back. It's on a fairly strong part of the bracing, I think. Oh, 
that's a pain. Look, this bit here is touching this bit here. That's really yanking that back. At the moment it's okay. But if I go another one on, I'm really going to push that, I think, too far. So what I need to do now, I think, is let everything off and then pop these in there, which will pull this whole frame up and means that it'll miss there. Oh, it's joyous, these types of jobs. Not the easiest thing to do. So I'm trying to make a template for the side here. So I've got some marine plywood that I'm going to use on the sides. Um, so I've just bought this you know, sort of floor protector stuff, which is now quite expensive actually, but it's a lot cheaper than the new plywood sheet. So, so I'm just going to use this as a template. And the good thing with this stuff is I can just use it all the time for templates. Anyhow, so I've sort of roughly got it in place. It's uh, struggling to stay in shape because there's too much of it. So all I'm going to do is roughly cut it to the shape that I need. Yeah, so it's going to be plywood along here. Something like that. Oh, it's so much nicer when you cut it down. You can start holding it again. All right. So I think I need it somewhere about there. Just put a clamp there. So it's been taking me ages to polish all this up. Real nightmare of a job. Oh, I do to test these freaking clamps. <clears throat> anyway, that's about there. Of course, I've got to make sure this is spot on. Because the thing is, this plywood won't stretch or shrink. You know, you can't... Um, well, the same with any sheet. You know, if, if, if it's slightly out here and you've got a bow here, you can't like sort of shrink the plywood in. I mean, it's quite difficult to do out of steel or aluminium too. Um, so I want to make sure this fits nicely. But at the moment I'm still in sort of get it roughly in place stage. So the plan is, yeah, I've got a fair amount of glint there from my nice shiny bit of stainless steel that I've polished up. The plan is you've got this plywood side along here, and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to put grooves in it so it looks like it's planks of wood. And I'm going to just drop a little bit of blue paint in each groove to match the bonnet. And then obviously a good marine varnish over the top. Yeah, this should get me a fairly reasonable, accurate measurement. And then I can test it and actually make sure it all fits properly make all the cuts, all the mistakes on this, and then use the plywood later on to get it real nice. Should be good. Well, it's not quite a traditional boat tail on a 1920s car, but um, it's a little bit different and I think it looks quite nice. So something like a year and a half later, two years later now, because that's how long it's been with the crankshaft and camshaft problems and issues but um, yeah I finally got all the plywood on all that time ago and that's uh, kind of what she looks like there. So she's kind of getting ready to run now which is really nice the engine's in and a lot of the stuff is now connected up so not long and hopefully she'll be on the road and then I can see what she looks like outside of the garage because you've been out the garage for two years there you go